an eyewitness describes the hanging of John Brown by Boyd B. Stutler, published February 1955, Volume 6, Issue 2. Harper's Weekly refused to print the story Port Crayon wrote at the scene brought to light 95 years later it is presented here. John Brown of Osawatomie, the guerrilla captain of Bleeding Kansas and leader of the abortive raid on Harper's Ferry to free the slaves was hanged on the bright balmy morning of December 2nd, 1859. The scene of the execution of the old abolition raider was at Charlestown, then Virginia but soon to become Charlestown, West Virginia, through the agency of a war which Brown's Harper's Ferry Foray hastened. Few men have filled as many pages of American history as the farmer, like Old Crusader, and none have been or are today more controversial. Down to this time, opinions as to his character vary almost as greatly as they did the day he was hanged. John Brown, as Edmund Clarence Stedman said, troubled them more than ever when they nailed his coffin down. All this introductory to an unpublished story of the execution by an eyewitness which lost for more than 90 years, has recently been recovered. The author was David Hunter Struther, who is better known under his nom de plume of Port Crayon, and who was one of the literary lights of the middle period of the last century. Struther was present at the execution as the artist-writer representative of Harper's Weekly, but because his publishers found the John Brown theme too hot to handle, his sketches and news stories of the hanging were rejected. Some little background notes are needed to make this Struther Port de Crayon manuscript clear to modern readers. Through fortuitous circumstance, he was calling on a young lady at Charlestown, who later became his second wife. Struther was on the scene of the John Brown War from first to last. At Harper's Ferry on Monday morning, October 17th, he saw the militia skirmishing with the John Brown Army of Liberation, and on Tuesday morning he witnessed the final assault on the engine house where John Brown, his surviving men, and his citizen hostages had taken refuge. He attended the trial a few days later, held in the old pillared courthouse at Charlestown, which is still a landmark, and was present when the sentence of death by hanging was pronounced. Fresh from the scene, Struthers sketches and reports of the raid and trial were grabbed by Harper's Weekly and were given top position. Leslie's illustrated newspaper, then the only rival in the weekly pictorial field, had hurriedly dispatched Alfred Berghaus, one of its chief artists of Harper's Ferry, and was making a field day of the affair in full-page pictures and graphic stories. Struthers' reporting did well for a few weeks, and Harper's was holding its own with Leslie's. Then came the explosion. Struther came of an old Virginia family, and was closely related by blood or marriage to most of the ruling families in the Potomac, Shenandoah area, nearly all of whom were slaveholders. Though himself an intense Unionist, he was by no means friendly to the abolition cause or to the immediate emancipation of Negro slaves. He wanted to preserve the status quo. His treatment of the raid and raiders violently displeased the anti-slavery element in the North and did not go far enough to please the pro-slavery advocates in the South. The Weekly soon came in for sharp criticism. Thus, caught between two fires, the weekly dropped the John Brown story like a hot potato. It contended itself thereafter by publishing a news symposium culled from the newspapers, inconspicuously placed in the domestic intelligence column. Struther apparently was not advised of the change of policy. At least, he was not recalled from duty. He continued to write and sketch down to the last act in the tragedy, but all this work went for naught. The press was not tenderly treated at Charlestown. General William B. Talaferro, commander of the Virginia troops, looked with suspicion on all strangers and had publicly announced that he wanted no abolitionists or Republicans in Charlestown on the day of the execution. Many newspaper men were turned back at Baltimore. Henry S. Olcott, New York Tribune men, went to Petersburg, Virginia, and through Masonic connections made his way to Charleston with the Petersburg Greys. Edward H. House, another tribunesman, spent weeks in Charleston, very much incognito. 
He needled and castigated the exasperated Virginian officers almost daily in the Tribune. Struther had no difficulty in wrangling an advantageous place. He was admitted to the staff of Andrew Hunter, his kinsman, special prosecutor at Brown's trial and the personal representative of Governor Wise. Struther took his position at the foot of the 13 steps that led to the scaffold platform. Cosby S. Noyes, Washington Starman, said in his telegraph dispatch, quote, Port Crayon Struther, the artist, a thin, sickly-looking young man, with others visited the platform for a moment. End quote. But Andrew Hunter was more explicit in an article in the New Orleans Times-Democrat, September 5, 1877. Quote, While the body was hanging, Struther slipped up, raised the cap from his face, and took a sketch of him hanging. He said that the celebrated Lydia Maria Child, a prominent abolitionist leader, had published that she wanted to have a portrait or likeness of John Brown in every condition of life, to hang in her room, and that he had taken this sketch to send her. End quote. Struther wrote his story and made careful drawings of the execution scene, but when submitted to the Messrs. Harper, both the story and sketches were rejected and returned to the artist writer. Less than 18 months later, the Civil War broke, and Struther hastened to offer his services to the Union. He served well through many campaigns and some 30 battles and emerged a brevet brigadier general. When the war was over, he resumed his connection with Harper's. When he died at his home at Charlestown on March 8, 1888, his papers and sketches were widely scattered. Only a few years ago, his manuscript story of the execution of John Brown, signed D.H.S., was found in the papers of a Shenandoah Valley family. Though written 95 years ago, it is here published for the first time, with Struthers' spelling and pronunciation. John Brown's Death and Last Words by David Hunter Struther, Port de Crayon. On Friday, December 2nd, the notorious John Brown was executed at Charlestown, Virginia, according to the sentence of the law. It may be a matter of curiosity to the public to know how a man whose late acts have created so much disturbance deported himself in his last hours. Although very guarded in his conversation on the subject, it was quite evident that up to a certain date he indulged in the hope of a rescue or possibly a pardon. When, however, he ascertained that the Court of Appeals had confirmed the sentence and saw the formidable military preparations made to ensure its execution, there was a marked change in his manner. The great gulf between the simple probability and the gorgon head of certainty was not passed without a visible struggle. He became more thoughtful and serious, less dogmatic in expression of his opinions, and somewhat softened towards those who had treated him with civility and consideration, and this included all whose official duties had brought them in contact with him during his confinement. He expressed a disinclination to receive visitors and sent for his wife, whom he had heretofore refused to see. Their meeting, which took place in the afternoon of the 1st of December, is represented to have been a most businesslike affair, without visible emotion on either side. On the morning of the 2nd, Brown sent for an eminent legal gentleman of Charlestown to write his will, or rather a codicil to a former will disposing of some property which had been overlooked. His manner then was cold and stony, his discourse altogether of business. After the completion of the writing, he inquired sharply and particularly about a dollar which had been mentioned in one of his letters, but which had not come to hand. He was assured that all the money enclosed in letters had been delivered to him, this, he insisted, was an error. He had the letter mentioning the enclosure, but the money was not there. Unwilling to dispute, the gentleman said that the note might have been dropped accidentally, and if found, the amount would be transmitted to his wife. But Brown was by no means satisfied, and at length informed his visitor that, in consideration of the service just rendered in writing his will, he might keep the dollar. This the lawyer politely but peremptorily declined, as he intended to accept no remuneration for what he had done, and again expressed a doubt as to whether the money had been sent. 
the letter was produced. In the body of the writing, the enclosure of the dollar was named, but on the margin it was noticed in pencil that it had been withdrawn and sent to his wife. To Kopak and the two Negroes, he gave a scolding, and a quarter each, remarking that he had now no further use for money. To Stevens, who had occupied the same room with him, he also gave a quarter, and charged them all to die like men and not betray their friends. To Cook, he gave nothing but sharp and scathing words, charging him with falsehood and cowardice. Cook denied the charges and attempted to dispute the points with his former commander, but was authoritatively silenced. As to the questions of veracity between them, circumstances seem decidedly to favor the truth of Cook's statement, and he may be readily excused for not caring to prolong a dispute with a man on his road to the gallows. Governor Wise and others, who were imposed upon by Brown's apparent frankness during his first examination at Harper's Ferry, have long since had occasion to change their opinions in regards to his honesty and veracity. However, all these matters I was not an eye nor ear witness, but had them from those who were. As early as nine o'clock on Friday morning, the field adjoining the town of Charleston, which had been selected for the place of execution, was occupied by a considerable body of soldiers, horse, foot, and artillery. A line of sentinels encircled the enclosure, preventing access by the fences, and a guard of infantry and artillery was posted at the gate by which spectators were required to enter. I repaired to the field some time before the appointed hour, that I might choose a convenient position to witness the final ceremony. The giblet was erected on a gentle swell that commanded a view of the country for many miles around. From the scaffold which I ascended, the view was of surpassing beauty. On every side, stretching away into the blue distance, were broad and fertile fields, dotted with corn stalks and white farmhouses, glimmering through the leafless trees, emblems of prosperity and peace. Hard by was the pleasant village, with its elegant suburban residences, and bordered by the picture east and west were the Blue Mountains, thirty miles apart. In the Blue Ridge, which lay on the eastward, appeared the deep gap through which the Potomac and Shenandoah pour their united streams at Harper's Ferry, eight miles distant. Near at hand stood long lines of soldiers, resting on their arms while all neighboring hills in sight were crowded with squadrons of cavalry. The balmy south wind was blowing, which covered the landscape with a warm and dreamy haze, reminding one rather of May than December. From hence, thought I, the old man may see the plot where his enormous crime first took the form of action. He may see the beautiful land his dark plots had devoted to bloody ruin. He may see in the gleaming of a thousand swords and these serried lines of bayonets what might be well calculated to make wiser men than he thoughtful. At eleven o'clock, escorted by a strong column of soldiers, the prisoner entered the field. He was seated in a furniture wagon on his coffin with his arms tied down above the elbows, leaving the forearms free. The driver, with two others, occupied the front seat while the jailer sat in the after part of the wagon. I stood with a group of half a dozen gentlemen near the steps of the scaffold when the prisoner was driven up. He wore the same seedy and dilapidated dress that he had at Harper's Ferry and during his trial, but his rough boots had given place to a pair of party-colored slippers, and he wore a low-crowned broad-rimmed hat, the first time I had ever seen him with that hat. He had entirely recovered from his wounds, and looked decidedly better and stronger than when I last saw him. As he neared the gibbet, his face wore a grim and grisly smirk, which, but for the solemnity of the occasion, might have suggested ideas of the ludicrous. He stepped from the wagon with surprising agility and walked hastily towards the scaffold, pausing a moment as he passed our group to wave his pinioned arm and bid us good morning. I thought I could observe in this a trace of bravado, but perhaps I was mistaken, as his natural manner was short, ungainly, and hurried. He mounted the steps of the scaffold with the same alacrity, and there, as if by previous arrangement, he immediately took off his hat 
and offered his neck for the halter, which was promptly adjusted by Mr. Avis the jailer. A white Muslim cap or hood was then drawn over his face, and the sheriff, not remembering that his eyes were covered, requested him to advance to the platform. The prisoner replied in his usual tone, You will have to guide me there. The breeze disturbing the arrangement of the hood, the sheriff asked his assistant for a pin. Brown raised his hand and directed him to the collar of his coat where several old pins were quilted in. The sheriff took the pin and completed his work. He was accordingly led forward to the drop and the halter hooked to the beam and the officers, supposing that the execution was to follow immediately, took leave of him. In doing so, the sheriff inquired if he did not want a handkerchief to throw as a signal to cut the drop. Brown replied, No, I don't care. I don't want you to keep me waiting unnecessarily. These were his last words, spoken with that sharp nasal twang particular to him, but spoken quietly and civilly, without impatience or the slightest apparent emotion. In this position he stood for five minutes or more, while the troops that composed the escort were wheeling into the positions assigned them. I stood within a few paces of him, and watching narrowly during these trying moments to see if there was any indication of his giving away. I detected nothing of the sort. He had stiffened himself for the drop and waited motionless till it came. During all these movements, no sound was heard but the quick stern words of military commands, and when these ceased, a dead silence reigned. Colonel Smith said to the sheriff in a low voice, We are ready. The civil officers descended from the scaffold. One who stood near me whispered earnestly, He trembles, his knees are shaking. You are mistaken, I replied. It is the scaffold that shakes under the footsteps of the officers. The sheriff struck the rope, a sharp blow with a hatchet. The platform fell with a crash, a few convulsive struggles, and a human soul had gone to judgment. Thus died John Brown, the strange, stern old man, hard and uncouth in character as he was in personal appearance, undemonstrative and emotionless as an Indian. In the manner of his death there was nothing dramatic or sympathetic. There was displayed neither the martial dignity of a chieftain nor the reckless bravado of a highwayman, neither the exalted enthusiasm of a martyr nor the sublime resignation of a Christian. His voice and manner were precisely the same as if he had been bargaining for a sixpence worth of powder, slightly anxious to get through the job, but not uncivilly impatient. A stony stoicism an easy indifference, so perfectly simulated that one could hardly perceive it was acting. As with John Brown, so it seemed with the spectators around him. Of sympathy there was none, of triumph no word or sign. The fifteen hundred soldiers stood mute and motionless at their post. The thousand civic spectators looked on in silence. At the end of half an hour, the body was taken down and placed in the coffin. The people went home, the troops wheeled into columns and marched to their quarters, and the day concluded with the calm and quiet of a New England Sabbath. No man capable of reflection could have witnessed that scene without being deeply impressed with the truth that then and there was exhibited, not the vengeance of an outraged people, but the awful majesty of the law. Signed, D.H.S. End of article. And so ends Struthers' story, which had all the essential facts in it, but which failed to somehow to hint that the Harper's Ferry raid and the Charlestown hanging had together been something like a lighted match tossed into a powder magazine. Within 18 months, the men who hanged John Brown, the men who thought him a martyr, and the huge number of people who paid no more attention to the whole business than they had to, were making war on each other, and a snatch of verse sung to the tune of a camp-meeting hem became a marching song for the armies in blue that would destroy slavery forever, a song known as John Brown's Body. It is recorded that throughout the Civil War, any Union regiment marching through Charleston would take pains to sing the song as the ranks passed the building where Brown had been tried and condemned. Probably the little courthouse town of Charleston 
heard that song sung more times than any other place in the United States. Hanging John Brown somehow wasn't the end of him. The execution was a beginning rather than an end, and Struther himself wound up as a brigadier general in the Union Army. Readers note, I know not everyone knows the song John Brown's Body. It was a precursor to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Or, if you need a reminder, it's the song that goes, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. If you enjoy other historical readings, please subscribe to the channel. I've also put a bunch of steam keys in the video. Don't go looking for them. Don't touch them. Don't do anything with them. I'm serious. Just don't do anything with them. Thanks. I, I trust you.